Hello. Um, in this video, I will be covering the subject of gravitation, gravitational force, and gravitational uh, potential energy. So let's begin. Uh, I will begin with uh, Newton's gravitational law. Newton's gravitational law. Uh, it basically says, the law of gravitation, is that if you have two masses, m1 and m2, regardless whether those masses are small or big, uh, and uh, so this is m1, this is m2, and suppose that they are separated by a distance r, uh, separated by from their, di from their centers, that is, and there will be a gravitational pull, a gravitational force between them, or a force of attraction that will tend to pull them together, okay? This force of attraction, F, is equal to um, the product of their masses, M1 times M2, divided by their distance squared, all right, up to a constant, we call it, the gravitational constant or the universal gravitational constant big G okay this big G has a specific value that has been measured in experiments is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared divided by kilogram squared okay so this is called the universal gravitational constant okay big G, all right? Um, so, what is this gravitational force? Well, it basically emanate, or this gravitational force, it, uh, it is inside any, um, any object that has a mass. Any object that has a mass associated with that mass is a gravitational field. And that field interact with other masses with their with their respective fields, okay. And that when they interact with each other, they tend to or there is a force that will tend to attract them uh, to each other. That force can be measured with this formula: the product of the two masses divided by their their uh, their distance squared up to a constant. G. So let me give you just a simple example of that. Suppose I have two masses, uh, m1 let's say m1 is equal to say 1 kilogram. I'm just going to make it uh, really simple. m2 is also 1 kilogram. So I have here two small masses, each 1 kilogram, that's about 2 pounds, right? And let's suppose that they are separated by a distance of 1 meter. All right, that's about one yard. So what is the gravitational force between them? All right, so uh, we can just plug in the numbers. So they have G times one kilogram times one kilogram divided by one meter squared. Of course, G is this number right here. And so when I calculate all of that, I'll end up with that the force is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, Newton. See how tiny this force is between two masses? It's extremely small, very, very, very small. And that's why, uh, you know, if you have, let's say, two pencils laying on the table, here is one pencil, and here is another, uh, you will notice that they're not going to be attracted or they're not going to come together and stick together. Why is that? Well, because the gravitational force between them is even probably weaker than that, than this number, okay? So the gravitational force by its own nature is a very, very weak force, okay? As a matter of fact, it's actually the weakest force of all the forces in nature, the four forces of nature. So it's a very, very weak force. Um, but we notice it here on Earth because underneath our feet there is this big, giant astronomical body we call the Earth. And because it is so large, we feel its gravitational presence or a gravitational field or a gravitational attraction to us. But any other object around us, we don't feel its attraction. You see what I'm saying? 
So the, the gravitational force, this force, is a dominating force only at the astronomical level. Only at, you know, say the Earth and the Moon, the Earth and the Sun, the Sun and the Milky Way galaxy, and so on. Okay? Okay, good. Um, I want to move on. We'll, we'll come back and do more complicated problems that are associated with uh, Newton's gravitational law. But I want to move on. I want to just uh, uh, talk about all the formulas in this chapter and we're in this topic before we start doing some more complicated problems. Um, another example that illustrates what I'm trying to say. Um, suppose, for example, uh, so let's say that here is the Earth, right? And let's say, figuratively speaking, I am here. All right, let's just say that I'm here somewhere. Uh, I hope you don't take that literally. Of course, my mass is some mass m. And suppose the mass of the Earth is big M here. Of course, the Earth has a radius r, which is about 6 million meters. I'm going to call it big R. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to calculate the gravitational force, this force, between me and the Earth. Okay. I mean, in other words, remember that the gravitational force here is calculated where R is the distance between the two centers. Notice that center to center. So here's my center of mass right here, somewhere right there, let's suppose. And here is the center of the Earth. So the distance from here, from the center of the Earth to my center, would you agree with me? It's for all practical purposes, it's basically the radius of the Earth. Remember, the radius of the Earth is about 6 million meters. And maybe my center to the, to the floor is probably a meter or less. So for all practical purposes, the distance between me and the Earth and the center of the Earth is basically the radius of the Earth. I hope you believe that. I mean, if I would draw, the, the Earth would be something like that. Here is the Earth. And I am really down there, not even much, much smaller than that. Okay? Okay. So, what I'm trying to say is, if I want to apply this law, F equals G, my mass, times the mass of the Earth, over the distance between us, which is, again, all practical purposes, is just the radius of the Earth. What would that be equal to? You can pause the video and think about it, okay? But what what would it be equal? What what is equal to is that it's also equal equal to to my weight. I mean, what is weight? Remember, we talked about weight in the past. What is weight? Weight is mg. Let me go back here. Weight. Weight w is mg. My mass. You know, let's say my mass is ninety kilograms, for example, times nine point eight. Correct. 9.8 and when I calculate that that's about uh, uh, 900 right so let me just get something more accurate so that will be 90 times 9.8 answer 882 Newton right well so that's basically my weight would it would you agree with me that this gravitational force between me and the Earth, which should be equal to my weight, mg. I mean, why? Because weight, what's the definition of weight? Is how much force Earth is pulling you with. Well, that's the same, the same definition as that. So now when we can actually cancel the masses, and we have a nice definition of g, and that's equal to the gravitational, universal gravitational constant, times the mass of the Earth, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. That's an interesting definition. Let me show what we get. I mean, you know what G is, right? G is equal to 9.8, as you know, meters per second squared. And if what I'm telling you right here, right here is correct, if I would put in the mass of the Earth and G and the radius of the Earth squared, I should get 9.8. Well, let's do it. Let me show you. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, times the, the mass of the Earth. You can look it up, or uh, you know what? Let me look it up for you. Well, we, I mean, I have it in the book, but uh, just for the sake of, for fun, let's just say for fun, I want to look it up 
on the web. Whoops. Let me just go within the screen here. Uh, mass of Earth in kilograms. There it is. And the mass of the Earth is equal to uh, 5.9724. All right. So I'll come back to that. So 5.9724. 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilogram. All of that divided by the radius of the Earth, which is approximately uh, uh, 6 million. Let's see. Radius of the Earth right here. And it's um, in meters. There we go. Uh, he doesn't put it in uh, scientific notation. But anyway, it is, as you can see here, 6.3 Let's say 6.4 times 10 to the 6. You agree with me on that? Let's do that. That's the average radius, of course. Uh, this, the, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. So that would be uh, 6.37 times 10 to the 6 quantity squared. Now, please pause the video and calculate, or you can just calculate this with me right now. I'm going to calculate it. And we want to see if we get 9.8, which we should, of course. So anyway, so let's do it. 6.37. Uh, e6 <clears throat> squared, and then I'm gonna take the after the reciprocal times 5.9724 times 1.67. Um, I had to pause the video and uh, because I made a mistake in my calculator. Anyway, if you have done it with me, you are going to get an amazing result, 9.81 meter per second squared. Okay? So that's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, so G, by definition, is equal to what? It's equal to the gravitational constant times the mass times the radius squared. As a matter of fact, this formula applies not just to Earth, to any terrestrial object. In other words, what, if I want to know what is G on the moon, so this is G on Earth. Okay, what about on the moon? Simple. All you do is G, the gravitational constant, which is this number, the one I just showed you here, okay, uh, fix that G, uh, times mass of the moon divided by the radius of the moon squared, and you will get that number. I believe it's 1.67. You want it on Jupiter? How do we get it? Simple. Same, the same formula, G mass of Jupiter over the radius of Jupiter squared. Look it up, and you can find the value of G. You want it on the sun? G mass of the sun divided by the radius of the sun squared, and so on. Okay. So this is a very important formula for astronomers, where they can find the value of G on any terrestrial object out there, okay? And we got it from what? From this simple constant, is that my weight, my weight, mg, is basically equivalent to saying that how much force Earth is pulling me with, which is the Newton's gravitational law. So by equating them, my mass cancel out. In other words, my mass is not important. And you will end up with just the gravitational field or the, the um, the, the acceleration to the gravity, and you'll get with this nice looking uh, formula. Please box it and, uh, in your notes and keep it handy because we're going to be using it later. Okay? Okay, good. Um, the second topic that I want to talk about, and that is potential energy, before I move on and start doing problems. You may recall, <clears throat> we said that the total energy of the system is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Remember that? And we said that the kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. As a matter of fact, it's always equal to one-half mv squared in just about any, whether we're doing the gravitation or we're doing something, <clears throat> excuse me, or we're doing something else. But the... <coughs> Excuse me. But the gravitational energy takes a different form. So what is the gravitational energy? Well, you want to go back to the definition of work. Remember the work energy theorem? We said that work is equal to delta U and it's delta K. 
very important theorem. Uh, almost every video that I do, I come back to this very important formula, this very important theorem. So what we want to do, we want to use this part of the theorem where we say that work is equal to the difference in potential energy. Because what the reason it's important is allow us to give us uh, it allow us to get an expression for the uh, for the potential energy. Now, by the formula, or by, uh, uh, by law, we have the work is equal to the integral of the force dx. Remember that? Or for our case, we'll call it R. Okay? So, the, what is this force here? Well, the force here is the gravitational force, right here this formula okay so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna take this force and I'm gonna plug it into the work formula remember last time we derived for example the spring potential we plugged in F equals kx Hooke's law and we got the potential energy of the spring so for now I want to plug in the gravitational law so when I plug it in I'm gonna get this so the force here would be um, G m1 m2 over r squared dr okay now because the force i want to be very careful about the sign here because the force is a attractive force so we're going to put a minus sign okay and also we are taking the work here is that we are bringing an object from a, some distance r all the way to infinity okay and that would be a negative work. So this would be a negative work. Work here is negative. Now, when I do that, I'm ready to integrate. And if you go through the integration, which is not very difficult to do, you will end up with something like this. I'm going to skip, skip some steps. The minuses here will cancel out. And I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to skip some step. You'll end up getting this. I hope you can probably see it without really carrying anything uh, it's going to be something like that with a minus sign here from r to infinity <clears throat> and then once we plug it in you'll end up with the delta remember this work is equal to g m1 m2 over r and that's by definition go back to this formula right here by definition is equal to delta u so this is work and it's equal to delta u in other words uh, delta u is equal to g m1 m2 over r okay what does that mean well what that means is that at if I have two objects, two masses, m1 and m2, they're separated by a distance r, okay? And if I ask you, what is the gravitational pull between them? u, okay? This u would be equal to g mass 1, mass 2, over the distance between them. This is, look at the formula here. Remember, we're talking here about gravitational, uh, 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 excuse me, gravitational energy okay not force okay but because the force between them is attraction attractive and and therefore we have a minus sign here so the minus sign here indicates attractive potential more on it in a minute attractive potential okay so every time we want to calculate the potential energy never forget that minus sign because the minus sign says it's an attractive potential okay the minus says attractive okay now delta u is not attractive is because as i take if i take those two masses and i'm bring them further apart now suppose that the two masses here in other words are at infinity so here is mass two here is mass one but now the distance between them is infinite well what will happen look at this formula right here plug in infinity in there what do you get 
you will get u equals zero. Okay? And that the meaning of it. So now if I take if I bring this R, this those two masses at distance R, and I uh, uh, put both of them at infinity, then the difference, let's say that this is U1 and this is U2, the difference between them, delta U, will be equal to this value, which is positive. I hope you see that. Got it? That's really the essence of this formula right here. So that the work, what I've done here, I, I took the two masses at the distance r, and I did work by putting them at infinity, at r is infinity, and with that, which is a negative work, the difference between the two potentials is a positive one. But each potential, the potential between the finite potential here, is a negative because it's an attractive potential. Okay? Okay. Um, let me give you an example and show you how this is, uh, why this, uh, this is uh, very useful. Uh, let me begin with example 13.1 from the textbook. Let me go back there. 13.1, um, <clears throat> and that's on page 344. Oh, it's right here. Okay. 13.1. Um, there it is right here. Uh, let me read the problem. He says, uh, crashing into the sun. Suppose the earth suddenly came to a halt stop and ceased revolving around the sun. Here it is the earth, God forbid, of course. The gravitational force would then pull, uh, the, would then pull it directly into the sun. Okay, so basically if it stops, the sun will pull it directly into it. What would be the Earth's speed as it crashes? Go okay, here it is. Here is the scenario. So here is the Earth going around the Sun, right? And somehow it stopped here for whatever reason. Okay? What will happen? What's going to happen? It's going to fall. Okay? Because basically a free fall. So it's going to fall toward the Sun like that. Okay? So at this here, the speed of the Earth is zero because it says it come to a halt. Now he's asking the question, what is the speed what is the speed of the earth just at the surface of the sun right here when the two surfaces touch each other? Okay? Figuratively speaking, of course. So what would be the speed of the of the earth? So what I want to do to solve this problem, I want to use conservation of energy. Remember, conservation of energy means the energy is conserved, which means the energy, the total energy here, K plus U, kinetic plus potential, is equal to the kinetic, uh, the, the total energy here, K plus U. They're both equal. So what I'm going to do, I want to calculate the total energy here and the total energy here, and then I'm going to equate them together and then solve for whatever um, I'm being asked to solve for. You got that? So that's the plan. All right. So let's do it. Uh, I mean, the only thing we need is... Uh, uh, table of data for, uh, you know, astronomical data. We need the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Sun, and uh, so on. So let me, let me go get those. Okay. So let me make a quick diagram of that. Uh, and by the way, there are some uh, notation that is kind of cool. I would, I, I like to use it. Uh, astronomers, they have the symbol of the moon is a circle for the Earth, is a circle with a cross in the middle of it like that. And then uh, the sun is a circle with a dot inside. In other words, when you say the mass of the Earth, mass of the moon, the radius of the, excuse me, the, the ma mass of the sun. Uh, this is the radius of the moon, ma uh, radius of the earth, or the distance between the sun and the earth. You see what I'm saying? So this is a symbol that our astronomers use, and I think they're cool. So we, they're very convenient as well. So I'm going to be using them. Um, and I have found uh, from, the, from the back of the book uh, some astronomical data that we're going to be using. Here they are. 
and I'm going to be those are very useful they're in the in the textbook so I'm going to be using them in a minute so let me um let me make a, a diagram of uh, the problem that we have just read so we said that here is the earth and here is the sun right here and here is the earth is about to crash in it right there okay and he wants he wants to know what is the velocity of the earth just before it crashes to the with the sun and of course this is the the earth right here where uh, it at this moment it is at a halt it, it, it's the velocity of the earth is zero okay uh, so that is the picture let me let me uh, make sure whoops uh, where am I I lost it okay oh well okay uh, so let's let's do this problem uh, so what I have in here uh, when the earth comes to a halt a stop so what is the total energy here well it doesn't have a kinetic energy so the total energy here k plus u but the kinetic here is zero so all of it is just u and what is this u well u remember u is always negative so never forget that because it's an attractive potential so it's going to be minus g the mass of the earth mass of the sun divided by the distance between them the radius between the earth and the sun okay we'll come back to those numbers in a minute but this is basically the total energy of the earth the moment it comes to a halt here okay now then it's gonna fall towards the uh, toward the sun correct it's gonna fall toward the sun and right before it hits it right before it touches the surface of the sun right here so what do we have in here do we have we have kinetic do we have potential and the answer is yes because as far as long as there is a distance between the two centers there is a potential so we have here here is the um, here is the radius of the earth and here is the radius of the sun so the distance between them is basically the radius of the earth radius of the earth plus the radius of the sun that's uh, gravitational potential so here the total energy would be what would be equal to one half mass of the earth velocity squared remember the velocity is going this way right and plus or minus rather remember it we said that it's plus u e equal I'm already down here e equals uh, k plus u or maybe I should put a minus there because it's always minus okay so uh, and minus u will in this case will be equal to let me erase all that sorry about that so it's going to be uh, g mass of the earth mass of the sun divided by see remember this r right here is the distance between the earth and the sun but here we have the radius of the earth plus the radius of the sun you see the difference so this one here let me let me emphasize that so from here is the distance from the earth to the sun but this is the radius of the earth and this is the radius of the sun and you add them up together okay and then those two must be equal <clears throat> right those two quantities must be equal and then you equate them together and you want to solve for v you see what i'm saying uh so basically equate the two together so it's going to be minus g i am writing this one down here that's going to be minus g mass of the earth mass of the sun divided by radius of the earth uh, excuse me the distance between the earth and the sun uh, uh what i'm going to do here let me see uh, equals to one half m mass of the earth velocity squared minus g mass of the earth mass of the sun divided by the radius of the earth plus the radius of the sun and then i will do the algebra it's an enormous it's a, it's a kind of a tough algebra a little bit of uh, you know you you want to be very careful about uh, what you're doing so you'll end up with this I'm gonna just uh, cut to the chase and just show you the symbolic formula V is gonna be equal to 2 G 
mass of the sun, and then parentheses, 1 over radius of the earth plus radius of the sun, uh, minus 1 over the distance between the earth and the sun, and bracket all, um, uh, one more bracket, sorry, under the square root like that. And then you plug in the numbers. How do we, so what, here we have here the mass, let me put this on the side uh, right there. And then, uh, so I have here, as you can see, uh, it's not going to work. I don't think I can squeeze it under here. Um, oh, there we go. I can maybe squeeze it like that. I'm trying to show you this. Anyway, there it is. Um, and then you just plug in the, the mass of the sun. The sun is right here. The sun is right here, and the mass of the sun uh, is 1.99 times 10 to the 30, and then uh, the radius, the the radius of the Earth is right here. The radius is um, 6.37 times 6 million, basically, and then the radius of the sun, the sun is right here. The the radius is 6.96 times 10 to the 8 meters, and you plug in all these numbers, and once you do so you'll end up with a number, the velocity of the Earth, as it crashes to the, toward the Sun, is 6 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. That's a really low speed. And there we go. Okay? Okay, good. Uh, let's do one more problem. Okay, um, the second example has to do with escape velocity. It's a very interesting concept. escape velocity or the velocity of escape what is the velocity of escape well uh, imagine you're standing and let's say you have in your hand a stone all right and then you throw it up in the air as hard as you can what will happen well it's going to go up 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 and they're going to stop and come back to your hand let's suppose that you want to catch it again now let's say you throw it even harder well it's going to go even higher and going to come back and you'll catch it again and so on um, here is the question. Would it, is it possible to throw the stone so hard it will never come back? In other words, you'll throw it so hard it will never, or it will rather, escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. And the answer is yes. That's the idea of a rocket shooting, or a missile, shooting towards space and never coming back, you know, going to the moon or going to space. Okay, so this is called the escape velocity. So the question is, with what velocity do I need to shoot something directly upward in order for it to escape the gravitational pull of that gravitating object? You could be on the moon and you want to shoot something. You could be on Jupiter. You could be on some, uh, you know, some, some planet somewhere and you want to shoot something. Uh, or even think of it like a, a, a volcano exploding on some, uh, you know, some exoplanet, and then it shoots rocks up in the air. Well, with what velocity uh, it needs to be shot, those rocks, in order for them to escape, to escape the gravitational pull of that planet, and then they would be into space and eventually coming uh, here to Earth or crashing into some other planet, whatever, okay? So that's the idea of, of the escape velocity. So, in other words, here is the Earth right here, all right, or any terrestrial object for that matter. Uh, here is an object, and I shoot the object with some velocity. Now, what is the velocity necessary for it to for it to escape? It just keeps going. It never it never comes back to the to that. Uh, so, I want to calculate that. Okay, so uh, that's not really what the example is, but I want to derive a formula for you. Okay, there are so many different ways of, of of deriving it, but I want to do it in a from an astronomy perspective. Here's how an astronomer would 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 derive it for you. Okay, uh, imagine the um, the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. Okay, so here is the sun, the um, here is the uh, let's say it's an elliptical path or a circular path. It doesn't matter for that for this example. So here is the elliptical path, and let's suppose that the Sun is right here. All right, 
and the earth is right here and let's say it's going in this direction like that okay so as the earth is going around the sun here is the radius of the earth and it's changing the earth is here the earth is here and so on okay if i ask the question how come the earth doesn't uh let's say as it's rotating how come it doesn't escape the gravitational pull of the sun and go like this and then it just shoots out like this for example it may go and then it will just shoot out and it will never come back how come it doesn't do that you see what i'm saying how come the earth doesn't do that well it doesn't do that because uh the the earth what we call it's gravitationally locked or gravitationally bound so we say that earth is gravitationally grav grav uh, if i spell it right gravitationally locked or bound to the sun okay this is a astronomer's jargon the earth is gravitationally bound or locked uh, to the sun or we can say that the moon is gravitationally locked or bound b o u n to the earth okay and so on okay you can you can talk about any terrestrial object going around another object so it's gravitationally bound well what do we mean by bound what is that mathematically or from a physics perspective what does that mean let me show you what that means in, in the simplest term it's much more complicated than what i'm about to tell you but it, in the simplest term is the following again monitor the earth here here's the earth here's the sun it's going around it and it is in, in a locked orbit it will never escape from the gravitational pull of the sun the reason is because if i look at the total energy of the earth it's basically k plus u or rather e equals to one half mv squared minus g mass of the earth mass of the sun over the distance between them like that okay it's gravitationally bound as long as u is greater than k this is important so this means locked orbit or bound orbit as long as the gravitational energy is greater than the kinetic energy the 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 orbit here the orbit to the earth around the sun is locked the moment you give the earth more kinetic energy or energy that exceeds the value of the potential energy this negative potential the quantity of the potential energy here so if k is greater than it will escape Escape. That's not that right. Escape. Escape from the Earth. Uh, excuse me. Uh, from, uh, escape from the Sun. Okay. So the condition here. So basically, so we have here k greater than u. That means it is unlocked or unbound. Okay. So far. So let me go back to this, our example of uh, throwing a rock from the surface and it coming back. Why does it come back? Well, because the moment you throw it, you're giving it kinetic energy. Let's take the rock and it's, and it's here, here is the rock. Let's take the rock at some point. So the rock is right here. Now the rock is somewhere here and it's moving up, right? With some velocity V. Well, the rock has a kinetic energy equal to one half mv squared, and it has a potential energy equal to minus g mass of the rock mass of the earth over the distance between them squared. Well, guess what? This u is greater than k. As long as u, this value, is greater than the kinetic energy, it will come back. It's bound to come back. The only way that I could throw the rock and it will never come back is that if I give it enough kinetic energy that is larger than the potential energy. This makes sense? Okay. It's kind of a cool way of explaining it. Okay. So what is the minimum escape velocity? Well, the minimum in this case would be if K and U are equal. 
Okay, so the escape, the condition for escape, or the minimum minimum value for escape, minimum value for escape, escape when u equals to k. In other words, um, uh, I'm going to ignore the minus. You can put it so g um, mass of the stone or whatever you're dealing with. Uh, times the mass of the Earth divided by their distance on Earth, let's say on, on Earth, which is the radius of the Earth, equals to one-half mv squared. And I am mainly concerned with the uh, the magnitude, so I'm just going to eliminate this minus. This minus doesn't mean anything as far as our, uh, we are interested in a number. And the mass of the object itself does not matter, believe it or not. In other words, that escape velocity that you are about to calculate, whether you want to shoot a small stone or a big missile, it's the same escape. So basically, solving for that escape, I'm going to call it E S escape right here. And that will be equal to square root of 2 big G mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth. And there we go. This is called the velocity of escape. Really cool formula. Velocity of escape. Now, what's cool about this formula? You can actually, uh, if you ask the question, what is the velocity of escape on the moon? So this is for Earth. So for the Moon, it's going to be exactly the same formula, except the mass and radius of the Moon. So it's going to be 2g mass of the Moon over the radius of the Moon. What's the velocity of escape on Jupiter? Again, you can look up Jupiter. Square root of 2, gravitational constant, mass of Jupiter over the radius of Jupiter, and so on, okay? You can apply this cool formula to just about any terrestrial object, the sun, whatever, okay? You got that? So anyway, that's another useful formula. So now let's go back to the example that I wanted to show you. <clears throat> um, and it is um, example 13.2. It's in the book. Um, there it is. Was that the one? Yeah. Um, 13.2. Two. There it is, right here. Um, so we have a picture. I'll come back to it in a sec. He said a 1,000 kilogram rocket. That's really heavy, right? That's a ton. One ton uh, rocket is fired straight up away from the surface of the Earth. What speed does the rocket need to escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth? and never return, assume an unrotating Earth. Of course, we're taking here a very, uh, 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 the simplest case scenario. Anyway, so basically here it is. Here is the Earth. He's going to shoot it up. This is up, by the way. Okay, maybe right, but it's up. So he's going to shoot it out of the Earth, something like a missile or something like that. So he's going to shoot up with what velocity it needs to be to escape the gravitational pull. Anyway, you can read from the book. He explained it differently from the way I explained it. But basically, what, what's the condition for escape? Is that the, 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 the potential energy of the rocket equal to the kinetic energy of the rocket, and that will give you the velocity of escape. And that's exactly what he has done here. And then when you calculate that, it turned out to be it's about um, 11 kilometers per second or 8 miles per second or 25,000 miles per hour. Okay, that's basically what it is. So let me go back to our notes here. So the, the, the picture, I like to draw it vertically. So here is the uh, the Earth. Here is the rocket right there. And I'm about to shoot the rocket up, and with a velocity. And we said that the the velocity of escape is what is it right here? So you are equating the kinetic energy with the potential energy, and you solve for it. You end up with this cool formula. I'm going to write it down. So here the velocity of escape is equal to 2g mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth <clears throat> uh, and the square root here. And when you plug it in, so you have 2 times 6.67, negative uh, 11, times the mass of the Earth. Go back to that astronomical data that I showed you. 
and the mass of the earth is right here it uh, oops it's right here it's about 624 all right so that's going to be six uh, five point nine eight or six times ten to the twenty four kilogram divided by the radius of the earth six point three seven times ten to the six and then uh to the to the you know under the square root and when we calculate that you will end up with something like eleven point two kilometers per second that will be one answer when you convert it it's roughly eight miles per second that's really fast by the way per second not per hour per second okay you you imagine you, you imagine that you travel eight miles in one second or it's about uh, 25,000 miles per hour okay that's really fast 25,000 miles per hour okay and there we go this is how you calculate the velocity of escape okay Okay, wonderful. Uh, one more problem. Example 13.3. And that's on page 346. Next page, I guess. 13.3 right here. Um, it says here, is that a picture? Yeah, there is right here. I'll come back to the picture in a sec. He says... Uh, a less than successful inventor wants to launch a small satellite into orbit by launching them straight up from the surface of the earth at a very high speed with what speed should he launch the satellite if it is to have a speed of 500 meters per second at the height of 400 kilometers ignore air resistance and b said by what percentage would you would your answer be an error if you use the flat earth approximation? I'm going to ignore part B. You can read about the flat earth. Yeah. Our textbook here covers uh, a section on about the flat earth. So I am not going to uh, talk about it in this video, but you are welcome to go back and read about it. So I'm going to do only part A. Okay, so what it says, what he's uh, saying here. Uh, so we have a, a, a satellite sitting on the surface of the earth right here. Okay, and he's asking the question, with what speed do I need to launch it? in such a way that at 400 kilometers above the surface right here, it will have a speed of 500 meters per second, okay? So what is that speed necessary? Okay, given this is the radius of the Earth, R sub E, he calls it, and so on. So what would be, uh, how, how would we do something like that? Well, uh, the way you do it is uh, use conservation of energy. So we look at the conservation of energy right here, E equal uh, K plus U here, and then K plus U here, and then equate them together, and then we solve for whatever we need to solve, right? He's asking, what is the speed here to get a speed of 500 meter per second at the height of uh, 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 400 kilometers? Got it? Okay. So let me go back and to the notes and make a drawing of that. <clears throat> So what I have in here, here is the Earth, and and here is the satellite. He's turning, he's uh, writing it as a dot, and like this. And then uh, here is the here's the same satellite at the height of 400 kilometers with a speed of 500 meters per second remember 400 kilometer is 400,000 uh, meters and he's asking the question with what speed here do I need to lounge it well uh, so what I want to do here I want to calculate the total energy here and what is the total energy here and those two total energy should be equal right because energy is conserved so let's start with the initial right here and that's later okay I'll call it prime whatever you want to call it so the initial here basically is going to be what uh, I have one half mv naught squared I'm going to call it naught here is that okay I call it naught okay that's the initial velocity that I'm looking for and does it have potential and the answer is yes because as long as there is a distance between it and uh, and the surface of the Earth right here, which is basically, um, if I can make it a straight line, for God's sake. So this is the radius of the Earth right here. So that's going to be minus, don't forget that minus, G mass of the satellite, mass of the Earth, 
divided by the radius of the Earth, like that. Okay? So that's the total energy right before I shot the satellite, right here. All right? There it is. Or, at the, sorry, at the moment I shot the satellite with this velocity B0, the one I'm trying to find. Now, later, right here, what's going on here? Well, we call it E prime. Remember, E prime and E naught are equal, right? So that's going to be what? Well, it's still going with velocity here. It still has a velocity, 500, right here. It's 500 right there. So that's going to be uh, 1 half mv squared minus g mass of the satellite, mass of the Earth, divided by what? The distance. Well, what is the distance? The distance is going to be the radius of the Earth plus this distance, which is 400 kilometers. You see what I'm saying? So that's going to be something like that. Radius of the Earth plus 400 kilometers. And, I, and I know I'm drawing, uh, I'm writing the wrong units, you know, should be in meters. But for now, just for brevity, I'm just using kilometers for now, but make sure that this is in meters. But that's basically what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to equate those two quantities and then solve for V. As you can see, a lot of number crunching. But if we do that, let me just, uh, so we equate them first. So it's going to be here. And then you do the algebra. And if you do that, so uh, equate, solve for V naught. So when you solve for V naught, you're going to get this. V naught squared, I'm copying this from my notes in front of me. V squared minus 2G mass of the Earth. And then you have a bracket, 1 over radius of the earth plus 400,000 meters, okay, um, plus 1 over radius of the earth, like that. And then we plug in the numbers, and then we work it out for v naught is equal to square root of some big number here. And when we work it out, we'll end up with, would you expect, let me just pause here for a second, go back to the drawing here. Would this number be greater than 500 or less than 500? Okay. If I was in class, I would ask you this question. I hope you will say it's going to be, of course, much larger than 500 because it's going to, as it goes up, it's going to decrease in speed, right? Eventually, if it, uh, you know, you may stop or something. So anyway, so uh, when you do that, it's going to end up going to be much bigger than 500 as expected. So the answer is going to be 2,770. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, meters per second. And there we go. And that's the answer. Okay. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, um, I want to talk about another topic, uh, and that is Kepler's three laws of motion. <clears throat> Kepler's laws of motion. Um, and when we say Kepler's laws of motion, there are three of them. Um, I'm going to go over them very quickly. Please go back to the book and read them in details or go to hyperphysics and read them in detail. They're very, very fascinating, very interesting laws. Uh, keep in mind, Kepler uh, came, came up with those laws before Isaac Newton was on the scene. Therefore, what that means is that before the invention of calculus. And Kepler's came up with them, uh, you know, just using algebra and trigonometry and an enormous amount of data that has been collected by an, uh, his teacher, uh, Tycho Brahe, and other, uh, like Ptolemy and other astronomers. And he calculated uh, all of that. Uh, he came up with those laws without him knowing anything about the laws of physics. He didn't know the laws of uh, angular momentum, conservation of energy, and none of that. Uh, he basically just used the laws of geometry, physics, uh, 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 geometry and algebra, and the analysis of the data to come up with those laws. So it's a very, very ingenious, uh, uh, you know, uh, German physicist. Um, okay, so the first law, like I said, I want to go over them very quickly, but please take the time to to look at them. So Kepler's first law. He says the Earth uh, rotate about the Earth, about the Sun, or orbit the Sun. Let's say orbit orbits 
in an elliptical path elliptical path or trajectory where the sun is located at one of its foci okay what that means is that he says the the uh, orbital path of the earth is not circular but rather elliptical okay as a matter of fact he, he i mean he said earth and sun but it really applies to any object that goes around any object in the in, in the heaven so we can talk about the moon goes around the earth in an elliptical path where the earth is located at one of its foci, blah 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 and so on okay so anything that goes around anything else the jupiter and the sun mars and the sun and so on okay or the moons of jupiter ganymede and, and jupiter and so on so basically if i show you a picture of it and i'm going to exaggerate the way it looks so here is the elliptical path again this is just a highly exaggerated way of looking at it so here is the ellipse and i'm sure you're familiar with the ellipse how it looks like this is the major axis and the semi-major axis and if you remember uh, there are two points here one is the, called the focus one here and one here that's the focus that's the center right here but that's the focus and then you got the earth okay here's the earth so what he says is that the earth goes around the sun in an elliptical path here we go the earth orbits the sun in an elliptical path like that where the sun is located where not here uh-uh it's right here can you believe it the sun is here at one of its foci uh, focus focus i think foci is that how you pronounce it for the plural of focus is right here okay so that's kepler's first law kind of a cool law all right second law I'm, uh, I'm reciting those laws from memory the second law says the following again let's go back to this elliptical path of the earth around the sun uh, again i'm going to exaggerate the way it looks it's not really like that it's almost circular really but anyway and uh let's suppose that the sun is right here here's the sun right and here is let's say the earth here okay uh what it says is the following before i write the statement of it imagine that i am I am on Earth right now, and I'm looking at the sun. I am on Earth right here, and I'm looking at the sun. Let's say I have a timer. And let's say that I um, say calculate uh, the time until the Earth comes here. OK? So let's suppose that this sometime, say, three weeks or five. Let's say a month. OK, let's say a month. And if I would, so uh, suppose that I am here in March. On the month of March and now it's the month of April March 1st April 1st for example okay and so what I want to do if I would draw a line that goes to the earth to the Sun like this and another line a radius and I would calculate the area here got it so far you may say why you do that just, just bear with me okay so let me, let me repeat what I'm saying I am here I have a stopwatch and I wait for the Earth and for a full month until the Earth is located here. And I would calculate the area of this sector. The area swept by the Earth in one month around the Sun. Okay? And then I would forget about it. And after a few months, now suppose that the Earth is here. Remember, the Earth is going in this direction. Now suppose the Earth is here. And I want to do the same thing. Okay, and I would let the Earth goes around the Sun for one month, and I would connect those two lines like that, and I would calculate the area here. Remember, I calculate the, the time here is exactly the same as the time here. Okay, whatever it is, two weeks, one month, two days, whatever it is, okay? What I will notice is that the Earth would sweep equal areas in equal time intervals. Isn't that interesting? Okay, the Earth sweeps uh, equal areas in equal time interval. Time intervals. 
Okay, that's Kepler's second law. And I think you would, you've seen this law before in the previous lecture, and that's basically conservation of angular momentum. Okay, that's really the concept. But anyway, Kepler did not know what conservation meant because physics was not yet invented. Newton wasn't on the scene yet. He didn't know that. Uh, rumor has it is that uh, when Newton came along and he saw that law, I, I, he was inspired to, to uh, discover or to talk about the angular momentum because of that. Okay, but that's basically what cover uh, what what uh, Kepler's second law is. So first law, I hope you'll memorize them because they are really cool laws. Uh, so the the first law is the Earth orbits the Sun in an elliptical path where the Sun is located at one of the focus or one of the foci, and the Kepler's second law is that the Earth sweeps equal areas and equal time intervals. The third law, however, is the more interesting one, the most interesting, because it's mathematical by its own nature. Kepler's third law, and it basically says, is that the square of the period, what's period? Period means the time it takes the Earth to go around the Sun, which is 365 days. If I take that number and square it, the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the radius, radius of the orbit, that is. Okay? Uh, later on in the lecture, I'm going to derive this formula for you, but basically it's a, it's a formula he comes up with. We're going to derive it later. The period squared is equal to, sorry, let me just put it this way. Uh, the period squared is proportional to the cube of the period uh, of the radius okay and it, as a matter of fact there is a, an expression for it uh, tau squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g mass of the sun here r cubed okay now you can apply this formula for the moon and the earth if it's moon and the earth this becomes the mass of the earth so right? and so on so that's basically Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law is this expression right here. Okay. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> um, I will derive this formula for you in a minute. Let me just do one more example. Um, let me jump to example 13.5. And that's on page, let me find it. Um, that's on page 349. Let me go back to the book. Okay. Extrasolar planets or exoplanets. Uh, it says in, in recent years, Astronomers have discovered thousands of planets, as a matter of fact, total of around 4,000 as of this date, of this date of this video, around 4,000. Uh, astronomers have discovered thousands of planets orbiting nearby stars. These are called exoplanets or exo exosolar planets. I believe the, the more common name is exoplanets. Suppose a planet is observed to have 1,200 day period. Okay, so this is the period. The period of a planet is... Uh, is whoops is uh, 1,200 days okay it, it means it takes the planet 1,200 days to go around its parent sun you see what I'm saying uh, as it orbits the sun at the same distance that Jupiter is from the sun okay so we need to look up Jupiter how far is Jupiter from the sun and that will be the radius of that this planet what's the mass of the star in solar masses okay I hope this is a kind of an easy uh, problem for you, but it, the whole purpose of it is to show you how to use uh, Kepler's third law, this law right here, all right? Uh, let me box it before I move on for the records. Okay. So let's write down the data here. So we have an exoplanet. Uh, the exoplanet, the period of this exoplanet is 1,200 days. 
and the radius of the orbit is that of Jupiter. So I'm going to go back to my astronomical data table right there. Uh, let me make it uh, a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, Jupiter right here, the radius is uh, right there, 7 times 10 to the 7, roughly, right? So let's use this number. Um, my, uh, let's see what your book is using. Hold on, I'm just kind of curious. Um, yeah, seven, okay, so he's using a different number, 7.78. That's funny. Anyway, um, 7. Hmm. Oh, that's, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading the wrong thing. This is radius. There we go. This is for the sun. I beg your pardon. Jupiter, 7.78 times 10, 11. I was reading the wrong number. There we go. Okay, so that's the distance of the sun. Okay, good. So what we have in here is um, radius here is equal to 7.78 times 10 to the 11 meters. And so I can just go ahead and use Kepler's third law. But before I do that, again, I want to do the algebra and I want to calculate the mass of the of that parent star. I'm not going to call it mass of the sun, so I'm just going to call it big M. Here it is. Or maybe mass of a star like that. And that will be equal to, uh, if I do the algebra, 4 pi squared r cubed over g times tau squared. Okay? And uh, am I ready to plug in? Yes, but uh, I need to make sure that tau is going to be in seconds. So I have 1,200 days. That's 1,200 times 24 times 3,600 seconds, right? And then when you calculate all of that, um, I don't have a cal uh, I don't have a number of me. Let me just calculate it for you. 1,200 days times 24 times uh, 3,600. And the answer is this big number, um, and that will be um, 1.037, roughly, times 10 to the power of 1 to 8 seconds. There we go. Okay. So that's the period of the exoplanet around its parent star. And then we plug in those two data. And here, simple, for, simple problem, I hope uh, there's nothing difficult here. And then you plug it in, and the final answer you will get to be equal to 2.59 uh, times 10 to the 31 kilogram. Okay, so this is basically the mass of the star, the, the, the parent star, you see what I'm saying? Now, he says in the, uh, in the problem, he says... Um, What's the mass of the star in solar masses? Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I'm going to go back to the astronomical data, and I want to ask, uh, I want to find what is the mass of the sun. Well, the mass of the sun is right here, is roughly 2 times 10 to the 30. So all I need to do is roughly, so the, uh, the mass of the star, of the parent here, is going to be 2.59 times 10 to the uh, 31 kilogram divided by the mass of the sun 2 or 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilogram and then when we calculate that that's about 13 solar masses you see what I'm saying and there we go so it's a pretty big uh, much much bigger than our sun 13 solar masses huge okay good Um, okay, um, I want to derive the uh, Kepler's third law and show you how that works. And please pay attention to it because it is um, it has certain points in it uh, that you will need to solve other problems in this chapter, that is, in this topic. So, derivation of Kepler's third law okay simple 
Okay, the first thing you want to do, the, assum the first assumption before you do anything, is that we're going to assume that the, uh, the orbiting or the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is circular, not elliptical. And that's really a good approximation because really the, the, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun or the Moon around the Earth, yes, so it is elliptical, but it's really close to being a circle. So it is a good approximation. It's a decent approximation. It's okay to assume that the orbit is circular. The reason for this assumption is because in this case the radius is constant. See, if it was like that, and here is the sun, as you can see, the radius gets bigger, bigger, biggest, then smaller, 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 smallest, instead of saying. So, uh, but of course, this is, this picture is highly exaggerated picture. And, but if we use a, a circular, however, so we have a constant orbit, you see what I'm saying? So it's going to be, try to make it a nice circle, uh, something like this. So let's say here is the earth and here is the sun. Okay, so as the Earth goes around the Sun this way, uh, well, here is the velocity of the Earth, V, and of course, this is the radius of the orbit, which is basically the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Okay, so far? Okay, now ask, we ask the question, I'm going to draw it again here. I want to put in the forces, okay? So here is the sun right here. Here is the earth. And here is the distance between them. So what are the forces on it? Well, we have a gravitational pull, you know, F. And because of that, we will have a centrifugal force and outward and get the force like that from the Earth and the Sun, and that force is equal to MA. Well, this A is centripetal force. Remember, this is going around in a circle. So that's a centripetal force. So that makes it M. Remember, this M is the mass of the Earth orbiting. Okay, this is the mass of the Earth. This is the mass of the Sun. See what I'm saying? So MA here is the... the you know, we're going to think of the Sun as stationary. It's not moving. That's a good approximation as well. And then you have the mass of the Earth going around, the mass of the Earth going around. Uh, so to a good approximation, that's just MA for the Earth. Where A here is the, remember this is the velocity. So that would be MV, uh, whoops, MV squared over R, R being the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun right here, this R, or this R right here. I'm just gonna call it R for now, okay? And the force here, what is this force right there? Well, that's the gravitational force. G, mass of the Earth, mass of the Sun, divided by the distance between them, squared, correct? There we go, I have that. This R and this R cancel out. I can solve for V squared. Uh, sorry, this is the, let me go back. This is the mass of the Earth, right? Let me just put it there. And this mass of the Earth, mass of the Earth cancel out. Let me solve for V squared, and that will give me G mass of the Sun over the radius, right? Radius of the orbit. Got it so far? Okay, I'm not done yet. Remember, here's the formula. I hope you will write it down. The formula is, what is it? Uh, right here, okay? Pause the video, write it down, because I want to come back and derive it. But here it is, okay? Okay, now. I have that. I have this formula. I need to get from this formula to the Kepler's third law formula. Well, how do I do that? Well, let me play with this velocity. What is this velocity? Well, velocity is basically distance over time. So that means the velocity of the Earth around the Sun is basically the circumference the Earth will travel or tra uh, traverse divided by the time. The time here is the period. So it's basically another way of writing it is that 2 pi r divided by the period, by the time, the time it takes to complete that one circumference, which is the period of the Earth. Okay? So I can take that, this formula, and plug it back into here. Got it? So now my new formula becomes uh, 4 pi 
squared r squared over tau squared equals g mass of the sun over r see that now, um, well, I'm sure now, by now, you are seeing this formula. This pops up right there. Tau squared, r cubed, and you get this constant, and it's exactly what we have in here. Cross multiply both sides, I mean, uh, cross multiply like this. Bam, bam, like that. So we're going to get here 4 pi squared, whoops, 4 pi squared, r cubed equals to g mass of the earth, Excuse me, mass of the sun times tau squared. And then finally, uh, tau squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g mass of the sun r cubed. And that's Kepler's third law. Now, remember, I did not use Kepler's laws to derive it. I used the uh, Newton's laws to derive it. And we come up with the same thing. Okay, so there we go. This is Kepler's third law. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> uh, I want to do example number 13.7. Go back to the book. 13.7, that's on page 351. And it is right here. This is the picture. Let me. I'll come back to the picture in a sec. Uh, challenge example. Challenge means, I guess, it's difficult. It says astronomers dis astronomers discover a binary system with a period of 90 days. Binary that means you have two stars orbiting each other. This one going this way. This one going this at the same time. Okay, that's called a binary system. As a matter of fact. My understanding, most stars out there are in, 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 a, in a binary uh, orbit. Okay, so he said the star had discovered a binary star system with a period of 90 days, which means it takes them 90 days to, co to make one full revolution. Okay, uh, both stars have a mass twice that of the sun, all right? So it's basically two solar masses. How far apart are the two stars, all right? So... How do we do it? Well, um, let's make a drawing of it. Here it is. Here's the picture. I'm going to draw a better picture for you. But that's basically here's one star going this way, the other star going this way, and they're going around each other. All right? Binary star system. Okay. So what I have in here, let me draw that. Hopefully I'll draw a nice looking circle. There we go. And then uh, here is the binary star system. Uh, I'm gonna draw it like that. Ah, not good. I wanna go through the diameter. Eh, there we go, that's better. Okay, so here is, this is the center right here. Here is one star. Here is the other star. And it says this is R. I don't like this big dot here. Let's make it a small one. All right, and this is R right here. And that is the V, the velocity going this way. Here's the velocity going this way. Of course, they're moving in this direction. Uh, you know, uh, uh anti-clockwise like that and of course you would have the uh, of course the, the the distance between them is 2r as says on the problem like that okay and we said that the period is 90 days of course you want to convert that to seconds we'll do that later uh, both stars have a mass so the mass of each is two solar masses Okay, and how far apart? So here's the question. How far apart? Okay, um, so how do we do it? Well, uh, I want to appeal to the gravitational force. 
And basically, I want to use Newton's second law. Some of the forces equal ma. So I'm just going to call F equals ma. ma here, basically, the mass of the star going around, if I take one of them, and the force here is a gravitational force. So the force here is a gravitational force. This is the mass of one of them. And this is the gravitational between both of them. And then, uh, and then of course, the, the acceleration here is centripetal acceleration because it's going around in a circle. Okay. So one way to do that is to say, well, that's equal to G, the mass of the two stars, M times M, which, or M squared, if you want, divided by how far are they from each other? Well, they're too far away from each other, correct? Remember the distance, remember the force here is the distance between the two masses, the two orbiting object, or not really, or I mean, the two, the two objects, the gravitating objects. So it's going to be 2R here, squared. I'm just applying Newton's second law, and that's equal to, let's pick one of the masses. Let's pick this one. doesn't matter which one. They both have M. There's a lot of symmetry in this problem. So that will be M V squared over, remember, this M going around in a circle with a radius R, not 2R. I hope you understand all that. And there we go. Once you get that, you're basically done with the problem. Uh, so that will be uh, what? Let me just clean it up a little bit. So you have G M squared over 4 R squared equals M over R V squared. This M and this M cancel out and this R and this R cancel out. And I end up with V squared equals to, uh, what is it? G M over 4 R. Okay. I'm not done yet. He's asking for how far are they from each other basically he's looking for what is 2r okay so uh, let me go back to this he said how far apart so what he's asking for 2r equals what that's really what he's asking for 2r so i want to find basically r once i find r then i got 2r so that's so far my my uh, my expression i have the mass this solar mass and he didn't give me the velocity, but he gave me the period. Hmm, that's interesting. And I know there is a relationship between the velocity and the period when we derived uh, Kepler's. Remember Kepler? There we go. Oops. When we derived Kepler's third law right here, see, we have that. There it is right there. See that? Velocity is related to the period. He gives me the period, so I can replace the velocity with this expression. You see what I'm saying? You see the plan? Okay. So go back here. We can say that, but the velocity is 2 pi r over tau. So, therefore, I can take that and plug it back into my expression here, and that will be equal to um, g m over 4 r equals to the v squared, which is basically I'm going to square that thing and put it right here. So that's going to be uh, 4 pi squared r squared over tau squared. And then all I need to do is to solve for r. If I cross multiply, if I cross this way and this way, I'm going to get r cubed. You see that? r and r squared. And then I'm going to work it out, just basic algebra. So I'm going to end up with something like that. I'm going to have uh, 16 pi squared r cubed equals g m tau squared and therefore r is equal to uh, g m tau squared over 16 pi squared to the cube root and i think we have everything all you need to do is to convert tau which is 90 or 90 i forgot what it is uh, 90 days right here. So you're going to convert that. And then, of course, you want to find the mass of the sun from the table. Uh, everything else is pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we have uh, tau is equal to 90 days. Oops. And so that will be 90 times 24 times 3,600, whatever that number is. And then you plug it in and you work it out. And I have gotten 4.67, I'm looking at my notes, 
times 10 to the power of 10 meters. So that's R. He said, what is the distance between them? And that makes it 2R. And that'll be equal to 9.3 times 10 to the power of 10 meters. And there we go. Okay. We got that. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> Okay, one more problem. I'm going to get it from the back of the book. I believe it's homework. And I think I should be done with the lecture or what I wanted to talk about in this lecture. So um, that's number 44. Let me go to the book. And that's on page uh, 355. It's kind of a short chapter, relatively. And it's, a, it's one of my favorite uh, topics in physics, gravitation. Uh, anyway, so there we go. This number right here. He says, an, an un, or the unexplored al, uh, planet Alpha Centauri 3. This is a real planet, by the way. It's actually the Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri. This is the closest binary system to us in Earth, uh, from Earth. I believe it's like uh, 4.5 uh, light years or something like that. Anyway, uh, you can look it up. The Alpha Centauri. Uh, the unexplored planet Alpha Centauri 3 has a radius of 7 times 10 to the basically 7 million meters. Uh, that's the planet, the, the radius of the planet. A visiting astronaut drops a rock from the from rest into a 100 meter deep crevice. She records that it takes 6 seconds for the rock to reach the bottom. What's the mass of the Alpha Centauri? Isn't that interesting? You can actually, just by knowing how long it takes a rock to reach the ground, you can tell the mass of the planet. Isn't that, you know, isn't physics interesting? Okay, so very, very cool problem. Um, I'll come back to it. So what you have in here, here is the, the crevice, if I pronounce it correctly something like that that is like a and here is the astronaut i'll give him a, a helmet i guess give her a helmet something like that hey that looks good huh look good all right uh so she throws a stone here is the stone Give her a personality. There we go. Something like that. All right. She throws a stone. Uh, so it's like a free fall problem, really, if you really think about it. That's kind of a free fall. So she throws the stone and uh, she. Uh, okay. So we know. Uh, let's uh, write it down. So we have the Alpha Centauri. I'm going to call it the radius of Alpha Centauri. Maybe I should call it big R. Radius of Alpha Centauri is 7 times 10 to the 6 meters, 7 million. Uh, she notices with her stopwatch that it takes uh, six seconds to reach the ground. And what is the mass of the Alpha Centauri? Okay, so that's basically what it is. All right. Um, so how do we even begin? How do how in the world would I know the mass of a planet if I know how long it takes a stone to reach the ground? Well, if I know g, okay. If I know the value of g, and then I can use that formula we used in the beginning of, uh, of the lecture, like the first 10 minutes or so, we come up with, or 20 minutes or something, we come up with a formula, uh, we can actually find it. So anyway, so I want to know, I need to find g. Well, this is, again, it's a typical uh, free fall problem. So I appeal to kinematics. I'm going to pick, since I have the time here, uh, I'm going to pick the third equation. Remember. Um, I don't know the, is the Y given to us? I'm not sure. Um, let me go back to the problem. He says the Alpha Centauri, yeah, 100 meters. I was wondering, it got to be, uh, we need the Y. There we go. He says here, a visiting astronaut drops a rock from rest into a 100 meter deep crevice. So the, the Y is given to us. Good. Now it makes it much easier. All right, so we know that Y here is 100 meters. 
and and I know the time. So I know the height and I know the time, the basic kinematics. So this is a very, very in interesting problem. So it's going to be y equals v naught t minus one half g t squared, right? Uh, the v naught is zero because she's holding it in her hand and she drops it. And so we are left with basically that. I know the time and I know the y, which is negative right here, right? Remember that? Remember that minus sign, lecture one or so? So that's going to be a minus 100 meters equals minus one half times g. I don't know what g is. Remember, this is an exoplanet. I don't know what, oh, sorry, uh, Alpha Centauri, whatever. Then time is six squared. So all I need to do is to calculate the value of g. You see what I'm saying? So I can do that very quickly. So I have here, um, <clears throat> Um, uh, 36 times half is 18, so I have here 100 divided by 18, and that's equal to 5.5 or 5.56, 5.56 meter per second squared, okay? There we go, here's the value of G of Alpha Centauri. I'm going to call it G sub Alpha, okay? Now, I want to continue on with the symbolic formulation, so I'm going to I'm going to start from here. I'm going to forget about this data right here, okay? I mean, what I've done here, just basically calculated the G value, but I'm going to continue on here. So basically what I have in here is Y equals one half G T squared. I'm ignoring the minus sign. Okay, I have that. Now, but what's G is equal to? Go back to the beginning of the lecture. Um, you will find that G is equal to g m over r alpha squared remember this formula let me remind you let, let's derive it very quickly in one minute we said that the the newton's gravitational law m1 m2 over r squared is equal to the weight m1 g so to cancel that and you end up with this formula you see that g equals that this is how you I mean, you can derive it in your head. And there we go. This is the value of G right there. And this G is, you can equate it to this one, and you can find the mass of the Alpha Centauri right here. You're basically done with the problem. But let me hold, let me, let me keep going with it. So with this in mind, so let me come here. So that's G is equal to 2Y over T squared. Take that and plug it in there. Again, I'm just, I'm interested in the symbolic formula. That's going to be 2y over t squared equals g mass of alpha divided by the radius of alpha squared. And I'm, of course, I'm solving for the mass of alpha centauri. And that will give me 2y r alpha uh, squared over g mass of alpha centauri. And there we go. I have this neat little formula. And then I'll, all I need to do is to plug in all my data in it. Uh, as you can see, I have eliminated the G. But again, there is different ways of doing it. You're welcome to use this G, plug it in here, and then you solve for alpha. That'd be, and you'll be done with the problem. But anyway, so let me continue on. And then when we do that, uh, you'll end up with 4.1 times 10 to the power of 24 kilogram and there we go we're done with the problem okay okay um you know what let me do one more problem before i finish uh that's problem number 54 let me do it very quickly and i will uh, we'll call it a day that's on page 355 the same uh the same page 50 50 54 54 right there okay it says nasa NASA would like to place a satellite in orbit around the moon such that the satellite always remains in the same position over the lunar surface. What's the satellite's altitude? Okay. What's the satellite altitude? Okay. So how do we do that? This is an example of what we call a geosynchronous orbit. Let me talk about it just a little bit before I move on with this problem. It's good that I remember it. Geo geosynchronous
orbit. Or orbits. Okay, a geosynchronous orbit is basically a communication satellite uh, that is above the Earth or the Moon or whatever, above the Earth, where the period of that satellite is exactly equal to the period of that parent planet. So in other words, the Earth rotates about itself in 24 hours, right? So that satellite goes around the Earth also at a speed in such a way that it's going around it with a period of 24 hours. In other words, you will see that satellite. In, in other words, if you're on Earth looking at that satellite, it will be above your head at all time. It will never uh, pass you or come uh, or, uh, you know, lag behind. Okay, it will always be. That's just a geosynchronous orbit. So a geosynchronous orbit is an orbit that has a period that is equal to the period of the parent planet. So a geosynchronous orbit for the Earth, the period of it for the Earth, it's 24 hours. For the Moon, the period would be, uh, well, the Moon goes around in, uh, uh, what is it? Um, I think it's uh, the satellite. That would be, um, I think, 24 hours, something like that, right? Okay. So now, let me go back to the problem. Number 55. He says, um, I'm sorry, 54. He said, NASA would like to place a satellite orbit around the moon such that the, the, the satellite always remain in the same position over the lunar surface. What is the satellite's or, uh, altitude? Okay, how far is it? Basically, he wants R. Okay, so the way we do it, we can say that So here we have the period of the satellite equals to the period of the moon, okay? And we can appeal, in this case, to uh, Kepler's, or rather, sorry, uh, the, we can appeal to Newton's uh, gravitational law. So we can say that F equals ma, a here being the centripetal force. Uh, think of it this way. Let, let me make a drawing. Here is the moon, and here is the satellite. Okay, here is the satellite right here. Something like that. And it is above this spot on the moon. So basically, as the moon is going around, the satellite is also going around the same in the same period. They have the both have the same period. So uh, in this case, the force, the attraction here, as it's going around, that's going to be um, g, mass of the satellite, let's call it m, times the mass of the moon, divided by the radius between, remember there is a radius here, r, so that's going to be r squared, equals to m v squared, over r okay so far uh, the masses cancel out and i can solve for v or here is a different way of doing it we know that v is equal to omega r remember that and omega is 2 pi f yeah, by the way you don't need to do it this way i'm just showing you a different way of doing it and 2 pi and f is 1 over tau so i can go 2 pi r over tau and there we go. So this is one uh, one way to do to do that. So I can take that and plug it back in there. So that will give me uh, g mass of the moon divided by the radius squared equals to four pi squared r squared over tau squared um, times r here. I forgot to, uh, I should have eliminated the r's here. But anyway, uh, when I work it out, I end up basically with uh, uh, something similar to uh, Kepler's third law. r cubed is equal to g mass of the moon divided by 4 pi squared, and then you have tau squared, right? Okay. Um, and then we would calculate that. Okay, now we are about ready to plug in the numbers, but we need to ask the question, uh, what is R 
and what is tau? Well, tau here, tau is the rotation of the moon about itself. Okay, remember the, the satellite is going around the moon in a geosynchronous orbit, which means the period of the satellite is equal to the rotation of the moon around, the, the period of the moon around itself. Well, how long it takes the moon to go around itself? Well, it is uh, basically uh, uh, 27, I think. It's 27 days, right? Uh, let me look it up. 27, I was getting confused. 27, 28. So we can say the period of the moon around itself. There we go, around itself. Uh, that would be 27. Let's just say 27. So that would be... Um, so here we have a, the period here is 27 days and that makes it uh, 27 times 24 times 3600. We're converting it into our seconds, right? So that is the, the period that we need to plug in right here. And then what about R? What is this R? Well, R, let me, let me draw this picture again. Because the way I drew it here, I think I'm, remember this R right here, it goes all the way to the center of the moon. Make sense? Remember from the center of the moon to the center of the satellite. So what is that? Well, R, let me, let me draw it again here. So here is the, the moon. Here is the satellite. Let's suppose the satellite is right here. Here's the satellite right here. Okay. So from here to here, I'm going to call that the altitude H. Okay. That's the altitude h, and this is the radius of the moon. So r as a total is r is the radius of the moon. I can look it up. Plus the altitude h. He's asking for the altitude. Go back to the problem. I I didn't pay attention to that. So that um, what's the satellite altitude? So he's really looking for h. He's not looking for r. You get that? So this H. So I'm going to go back and plug in this one in here. And then I have this number. I'm going to plug it in here. And then I'm going to do the algebra. So when you do that, so the first thing I need to do, probably the best thing to do, keep it the way it is. Don't make things complicated. You don't need to plug this one and then cube. Just get a number out of this R. So when I get a number out of it, so you plug everything in there. And that's going to be G mass of the moon. Divided by 4 pi squared times tau squared. Again, the tau squared is this big number right here. All of that to the cube root, to the one third. You plug in that number and you're going to get, <clears throat> um, do I, yeah, I have it here, 8.8 for, I hope I didn't make any mistakes, but that's my answer to it is this. That's the total. That's the total distance from the center of the moon to the satellite. You got it? Therefore, the altitude, there it is right here, right there, the altitude is going to be r minus the radius of the moon. And then we can just plug this one in, and it will turn out to be roughly 8.67 uh, times 10 to the power of 7 meters. And there we go. That's the altitude. This is how high the uh, the satellite uh, from the surface of the moon. You got that? Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to end here. Yeah, I mean, I can do more problems in class and person to person, uh, but I'm going to stop here. Bye-bye.